Continuing our reading of Thomas Watson's A Body of Divinity, Part 3, The Fall. Section 1, The Covenant of Works, Question 12. I proceed to the next question. What special act of providence did God exercise toward man in the estate wherein he was created? Answer, when God created man, he entered into a covenant of life with him upon condition of perfect obedience, forbidding him to eat of the tree of knowledge upon pain of death. For this, consult with Genesis 2, 16 and 17. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat. For in the day thou eatest of it thou shalt surely die." The subject of our next discourse in this covenant of works. 1. This covenant was made with Adam and all mankind, for Adam was a public person and the representative of the world. For what reason did God make a covenant with Adam and his posterity in innocence? First, to show his sovereignty over us. We were his creatures, and as he was the great monarch of heaven and earth, he might impose upon us terms of a covenant. Second, God made a covenant with Adam to bind him fast to him. As God bound himself to Adam, so Adam was bound to him by the covenant. What was the covenant? God commanded Adam not to eat of the tree of knowledge, but gave him leave to eat of all the other trees of the garden. God did not envy him any happiness, but said, Meddle not with this tree of knowledge, because he would try Adam's obedience. As King Pharaoh made Joseph chief ruler of his kingdom, and gave him a ring off his finger and a chain of gold, but said he must not touch his throne, Genesis 41.40, in like manner God dealt with Adam. He gave him a sparkling jewel, knowledge, and put upon him the garment of original righteousness. Only said he, Touch not the tree of knowledge, for that is aspiring after omniscience. Adam had power to keep this law, he had the copy of God's law written in his heart. This covenant of works had a promise annexed to it, and a threatening, firstly, the promise was, do this and live. In case man had stood, it is probable he would not have died, but would have been translated to a better paradise. Secondly, the threatening, thou shalt die the death. In the Hebrew, in dying thou shalt die. That is, thou shalt die both a natural death and an eternal, unless some expedient be found out for thy restoration. Why, you may ask, did God give Adam this law, seeing he foresaw that Adam would transgress it? First, it was Adam's fault that he did not keep the law. God gave him a stock of grace to trade with, but by his own neglect he failed. Second, though God foresaw Adam would transgress, yet that was not a sufficient reason that no law should be given him, for by the same reason God should not have given his written word to men to be a rule of faith and manners, because he foresaw that some would not believe and others would be profane. Shall laws not be made in the land because some will break them? Third, though God foresaw Adam would break the law, he knew how to turn it to greater good in sending Christ. The first covenant being broken, he knew how to establish a second, a better. Two, concerning the first covenant, consider these four things. First, the form of the covenant in innocence was working, do this and live. Working was the ground and condition of man's justification, Galatians 3.12. Not but that working is required in the covenant of grace, for we are bid to work out our salvation and be rich in good works, but works in the covenant of grace are not required under the same notion as in the first covenant with Adam. Works are not required for the justification of our persons, but as an attestation of our love to God, not as the cause of our salvation, but as an evidence of our adoption. Works are required in the covenant of grace, not so much in our own strength as in the strength of another. It is God which worketh in you, Philippians 2.13. As the teacher guides the child's hand and helps him to form his letters, so that it is not so much the child's writing as the master's, so our obedience is not so much our working as the Spirit's co-working. Second, the covenant of works was very strict. God required of Adam and all mankind, firstly, perfect obedience. Adam must do all things written in the book of the law and not fail either in the matter or manner, Galatians 3.10. 
Adam was to live up to the whole breadth of the moral law and go exactly according to it, as a well-made dial goes with the sun. One sinful thought would have forfeited the covenant. Secondly, personal obedience. God must not do his work by a proxy or have any surety bound for him, but it must be done in his own person. Thirdly, perpetual obedience. He must continue in all things written in the book of the law, Galatians 3.10. Thus it was very strict. There was no mercy in case of failure. Third, the covenant of works was not built upon a very firm basis, and therefore must needs leave men full of fears and doubts. The covenant of works rested upon the strength of man's inherent righteousness, which, though in innocence was perfect, yet was subject to change. Adam was created holy but mutable, having a power to stand and a power to fall. He had a stock of original righteousness to begin the world with, but was not sure he would not break. He was his own pilot and could steer right in the time of innocence, but he was not so secured but that he might dash against the rock of temptation, and he and his posterity be shipwrecked, so that the covenant of works must needs leave jealousies and doubtings in Adam's heart, as he had no security given him that he should not fall from that glorious state. Fourth, the covenant of works being broken by sin, man's condition was very deplorable and desperate. He was left in himself helpless. There was no place for repentance. The justice of God being offended set all the other attributes against him. When Adam lost his righteousness, he lost his anchor of hope and his crown. There was no way for relief unless God would find out such a way as neither man nor angel could devise. Use 1 see, firstly, the condescension of God, who was pleased to stoop so low as to make a covenant with us, for the God of glory to make a covenant with dust and ashes, for God to bind himself to us, to give us life in case of obedience, for him to enter into covenant with us was a sign of friendship and a royal act of favor. Secondly, see what a glorious condition man was in when God entered into covenant with him. He was placed in the garden of God, which for the pleasure of it was called paradise. Genesis 2.8 He had his choice of all the trees, only one accepted. He had all kinds of precious stones, pure metals, rich cedars. He was a king upon the throne, and all the creation did obeisance to him. As in Joseph's dream, all his brethren's sheaves bowed to his sheaf. Man in innocence had all kinds of pleasure that might ravish his senses with delight and be as baits to allure him to serve and to worship his Maker. He was full of holiness. Paradise was not more adorned with fruit than Adam's soul was with grace. He was the coin on which God had stamped his lively image. Light sparkled in his understanding so that he was like an earthly angel, and his will and affections were full of order, turning harmoniously to the will of God. Adam was a perfect pattern of sanctity. Adam had intimacy of communion with God, and conversed with him as a favorite with his prince. He knew God's mind and had his heart. He not only enjoyed the light of the sun in paradise, but the light of God's countenance. This was Adam's condition when God entered into a covenant with him, but this did not long continue, for man being in honor abideth not, lodged not for a night. Psalm 49.12 his teeth watered at the apple, and ever since it has made our eyes water. Thirdly, learn from Adam's fall how unable we are to stand in our own strength. If Adam, in the state of integrity, did not stand, how unable are we now when the lock of our original righteousness is cut? If purified nature did not stand, how then shall corrupt nature? We need more strength to uphold us than our own. Fourthly, see in what a sad condition all unbelievers and impenitent persons are. As long as they continue in their sins, they continue under the curse, under the first covenant. Faith entitles us to the mercy of the second covenant, but while men are under the power of their sins, they are under the curse of the first covenant. And if they die in that condition, they are damned to eternity." Fifthly, see the wonderful goodness of God who was pleased when man had forfeited the first covenant to enter into a new covenant with him. Well, it may be called a covenant of grace, for it is bespangled with promises as the heaven with stars. When the angels, those glorious spirits, fell, God did not enter into a new covenant with them to be their God, but 
he let those golden vessels lie broken. Yet he has entered into a second covenant with us, better than the first, Hebrews 8, 6. It is better because it is surer. It is made in Christ and cannot be reversed. Christ has engaged his strength to keep every believer. In the first covenant we had a power of standing. In the second we had an impossibility of falling, finally, 1 Peter 1, 5. Sixthly, whosoever they are that look for righteousness and salvation by the power of their free will or the inherent goodness of their nature or by virtue of their merit as the Socinians and Papists, they are all under the covenant of works. They do not submit to the righteousness of faith. Therefore, they are bound to keep the whole law, and in case of failure, they are condemned. The covenant of grace is like a court of chancery to relieve the sinner and help him who is cast by the first covenant. It says, Believe in the Lord Jesus and be saved. But such as will stand upon their own inherent righteousness, free will, and merit fall under the first covenant of works and are in a perishing estate. Used to. Let us labor by faith to get into the second covenant of grace, and then the curse of the first covenant will be taken away by Christ. If we once get to be heirs of the covenant of grace, we are in a better state than before. Adam stood on his own legs, and therefore he fell. We stand in the strength of Christ. Under the first covenant, the justice of God as an avenger of blood pursues us. But if we get into the second covenant, we are in the city of refuge. We are safe and the justice of God is pacified towards us. Section 2. Sin. Question 14. What is sin? Answer. Sin is any want of conformity to the law of God or transgression of it. Sin is the transgression of the law. 1 John 3, 4. Of sin in general, first, sin is a violation or transgression. The Latin word to transgress signifies to go beyond one's bounds. The moral law is to keep us within the bounds of duty. Sin is going beyond our bounds. Second, the law of God is not the law of an inferior prince, but of Jehovah, who gives laws as well to angels as men. It is a law that is just and holy and good, Romans 7.12. It is just that there is nothing in it unequal, holy, nothing in it impure, good, nothing in it prejudicial, so that there is no reason to break this law, no more than for a beast that is in a fat pasture to break over the hedge or to leap into a barren heath or quagmire. I shall show what a heinous and execrable thing sin is. It is the complication of all evil. It is the spirits of mischief distilled. The Scripture calls it the accursed thing. Joshua 7.13 It is compared to the venom of serpents and the stench of sepulchres. The Apostle uses this expression of sin out of measure sinful in Romans 7.13 or, as it is in the Greek, hyperbolically sinful. The devil would paint sin with a vermilion color of pleasure and profit that he may make it look fair, but I shall pull off the paint that you may see its ugly face. We are apt to have slight thoughts of sin and say to it as Lot of Zoar, Is it not a little one? Genesis 19.20 But that you may see how great an evil sin is, consider these four things. 1. The origin of sin from whence it comes. It fetches its pedigree from hell. Sin is of the devil. He that committeth sin is of the devil, 1 John 3, 8. Satan was the first actor of sin and the first tempter to sin. Sin is the devil's firstborn. Two, sin is evil in the nature of it. First, it is a defiling thing. Sin is not only a defection but a pollution. It is to the soul as rust is to gold, as a stain to beauty. It makes the soul red with guilt and black with filth. Sin in Scripture is compared to a menstruous cloth, Isaiah 30.22, and to a plague sore in 1 Kings 8.38. Joshua's filthy garments in which he stood before the angel were nothing but a type and hieroglyphic of sin, Zechariah 3.3. 3. Sin has blotted God's image and stained the orient brightness of the soul. It makes God loathe a sinner, Zechariah 11:8, and when a sinner sees his sin, he loathes himself, 
Ezekiel 20:43. Sin drops poison on our holy things. It infects our prayers. The high priest was to make atonement for sin on the altar to typify that our holiest services need Christ to make an atonement for them. Exodus 29:36. Duties of religion in themselves are good, but sin corrupts them as the purest water is polluted by running through muddy ground. If the leper under the law had touched the altar, the altar would not have cleansed him, but he would have defiled the altar. The apostle calls sin filthiness of flesh and spirit in 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Sin stamps the devil's image on a man. Malice is the devil's eye. Hypocrisy his cloven foot. It turns a man into a devil. Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? John 6, 70. Second, sin is grieving God's Spirit. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, Ephesians 4:30. To grieve is more than to anger. How, you ask, can the Spirit be said to be grieved? For seeing He is God, He cannot be subject to any passion. This is spoken metaphorically. Sin is said to grieve the Spirit because it is an injury offered to the Spirit, and he takes it unkindly and, as it were, lays it to heart. And is it not much thus to grieve the Spirit? The Holy Ghost descended in the likeness of a dove, and sin makes this blessed dove mourn. Were it only an angel, we should not grieve him, much less the Spirit of God. It is, and is it not sad, to grieve our Comforter? Third, sin is an act of contumacy against God, a walking antipodes to heaven. If ye will walk contrary to me, Leviticus 26:27, a sinner tramples upon God's law, crosses his will, does all he can to affront, yea, to spite God. The Hebrew word for sin signifies rebellion. There is the heart of a rebel in every sin. We will do whatsoever proceedeth out of our own mouth to burn incense to the Queen of Heaven. Jeremiah 44:17. Sin strikes at the very deity. Sin is God's would-be murderer. Sin would not only unthrone God, but ungod him. If the sinner could help it, God would no longer be God. Fourth, sin is an act of disingenuity and unkindness. God feeds the sinner, keeps off evils from him, bemiracles him with mercy, but the sinner not only forgets God's mercies, but abuses them. He is the worse for mercy, like Absalom, who, as soon as David had kissed him, had taken him into favor, plotted treason against him. 2 Samuel 15.10 Like the mule who kicks the dam after she has given it milk, is this thy kindness to thy friend? 2 Samuel 16.17 God may upbraid the sinner. I have given thee, he may say, thy health, strength, and estate. But thou requitest me evil for good. Thou woundest me with my own mercies. Is this thy kindness to thy friend? Did I give thee life to sin? Did I give thee wages to serve the devil? Fifth, sin is a disease. The whole head is sick. Isaiah 1.5 Some are sick of pride, others of lust, others of envy. Sin has distempered the intellectual part. It is a leprosy in the head. It has poisoned the vitals. Their conscience is defiled. Titus 1.15 It is with a sinner as with a sick patient. His palate is distempered. The sweetest things taste bitter to him. The word which is sweeter than the honeycomb, Psalm 19.10, tastes bitter to him. He puts sweet for bitter, Isaiah 5.20. This is a disease, and nothing can cure this disease but the blood of the physician. Sixth, sin is an irrational thing. It makes a man act not only wickedly, but foolishly. It is absurd and irrational to prefer the less before the greater, the pleasures of life before the rivers of pleasures at God's right hand forevermore. Is it not irrational to lose heaven for the satisfying or indulging of lust? As one who for a draught of water lost a kingdom... Is it not irrational to gratify an enemy? In sin we do so. When lust or rash anger burns the soul, Satan warms himself at this fire. Men's sins feast the devil. Seventh sin is a painful thing. It costs men much labor to pursue their sins. How do they tire themselves in doing the devil's drudgery? 
They weary themselves to commit iniquity, Jeremiah 9, 5. What pains did Judas take to bring about his treason? He goes to the high priest, and then after to the band of soldiers, and then back again to the garden. Chrysostom says virtue is easier than vice. It is more pains to some to follow their sins than to others to worship their God. While the sinner travails with his sin, in sorrow he brings forth, which is called serving divers lusts, Titus 3, 3. Not enjoy, but serve. Why so? Because not only of the slavery in sin, but the hard labor, it is serving divers lusts. Many a man goes to hell in the sweat of his brow. Eighth, sin is the only thing God has an antipathy against. God does not hate a man because he is poor or despised in the world, as you do not hate your friend because he is sick, but that which draws forth the keenness of God's hatred is sin. Oh, do not this abominable thing that I hate, Jeremiah 44, 4. And sure, if the sinner dies under God's hatred, he cannot be admitted into the celestial mansions. Will God let the man live with him whom he hates? God will never lay a viper in his bosom. The feathers of the eagle will not mix with the feathers of other fowls, so God will not mix and incorporate with a sinner. Till sin be removed, there is no coming where God is. Third part. See the evil of sin in the price paid for it. It cost the blood of God to expiate it. O man, says Augustine, consider the greatness of thy sin, by the greatness of the price paid for sin. All the princes on earth or angels in heaven could not satisfy for sin, only Christ. Nay, Christ's active obedience was not enough to make atonement for sin, but he must suffer upon the cross. For without blood is no remission, Hebrews 9.22. Oh, what an accursed thing sin is that Christ should die for it. The evil of sin is not so much seen in that one thousand are damned for it, as that Christ died for it. Fourth, sin is evil in its effects. First, sin has degraded us of our honor. Reuben by incest lost his dignity, and though he was the firstborn, he could not excel. Genesis 49, 4. God made us in his own image, a little lower than the angels, but sin has debased us. Before Adam sinned, he was like a herald that has his coat of arms upon him. All reverence him, because he carries the king's coat of arms, but let this coat be pulled off, and he is despised. No man regards him. Sin has done this. It has plucked off our coat of innocence, and now it has debased us and turned our glory into shame. And there shall stand upon a vile person... Daniel 11.21, this was spoken of Antiochus Epiphanes, who was a king, and his name signifying illustrious, yet sin degraded him. Up stood a vile person. He was a vile person. Second, sin disquiets the peace of the soul. Whatever defiles, disturbs. As poison tortures the bowels, corrupts the blood, so sin does the soul, Isaiah 57.21, sin breeds a trembling at the heart. It creates fears, and there is torment in fear. 1 John 4.18, sin makes sad convulsions in the conscience. Judas was so terrified with guilt and horror that he hanged himself to quiet his conscience. And is not he like to be ill-cured that throws himself into hell for ease? 3. Sin produces all temporal evil. Jerusalem has grievously sinned, therefore she is removed, Lamentations 1.8. It is the Trojan horse that has sword and famine and pestilence in its belly. Sin is a coal that not only blacks, but burns. Sin creates all our troubles. It puts gravel into our bread, wormwood in our cup. Sin rots the name, consumes the estate, buries relation. Sin shoots the flying roll of God's curses into a family and kingdom, Zechariah 5, 4. It is reported of Phocas that, having built a wall of mighty strength about his city, there was a voice heard, Sin is within the city, and that will throw down the wall. Fourth, sin unrepented of brings final damnation. The canker that breeds in the rose is the cause of its perishing, and corruptions that breed in men's souls are the cause of their damning. 
Sin without repentance brings the second death, that is, Bernard, a death always dying, Revelation 20:14. Sin's pleasure will turn to sorrow at last, like the book the prophet did eat, sweet in the mouth but bitter in the belly, Ezekiel 3, 3, Revelation 10:9. Sin brings the wrath of God, and what bucket or engines can quench that fire, where the worm never dies and the fire is not quenched? Mark 9.44 Use one. See how deadly and evil sin is, and how strange it is that any one should love it. How long will ye love vanity? Psalm 4.2 Who look to other gods and love flagons of wine? Hosea 3.1 Sin is a dish men cannot forbear, though it makes them sick. Who would pour rose water into a kennel? What pity is it to so sweet an affection as love should be poured upon so filthy a thing as sin? Sin brings a sting in the conscience, a curse in the estate, yet men love it. A sinner is the greatest self-denier. For his sin he will deny himself a part in heaven. Used to do anything rather than sin. Oh, hate sin. There is more evil in the least sin than in the greatest bodily evils that can befall us. The ermine rather chooses to die than defile her beautiful skin. There is more evil in a drop of sin than in a sea of affliction. Affliction is but like a rent in a coat, sin a prick in the heart. In affliction there is some good, in this lion there is some honey to be found. It is good for me that I was afflicted. Psalm 119.71 so Augustine says, Affliction is God's flail to thresh off our husks, not to consume, but to refine. There is no good in sin. It is the spirit and quintessence of hell. Sin is worse than hell, for the pains of hell are a burden to the creature only. But sin is a burden to God, the quintessence of evil. I am pressed under your iniquities, as a cart is pressed under the sheaves. Amos 2.13 Use 3 Is sin so great and evil? Then how thankful should you be to God if He has taken away your sin? I have caused thy iniquity to pass from thee. Zechariah 3.4 If you had a disease on your body, plague, or dropsy, how thankful would you be to have it taken away? Much more to have sin taken away. God takes away the guilt of sin by pardoning grace and the power of sin by mortifying grace. Oh, be thankful that this sickness is not unto death, that God has changed your nature and, by grafting you into Christ, made you partake of the sweetness of that olive, that sin, though it live, does not reign, but the elder serves the younger. Sin, the elder, serves grace, the younger. Section 3. Adam's Sin Question 15. What was the sin whereby our first parents fell from the estate wherein they were created? Answer. That sin was eating the forbidden fruit. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also to her husband with her. Genesis 3, 6. Here is implied, one, that our first parents fell from their estate of innocence. Two, the sin by which they fell was eating the forbidden fruit. One. Our first parents fell from their glorious state of innocence. God made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. Ecclesiastes 7.29 Adam was perfectly holy. He had rectitude of mind and liberty of will to good, but his head ached till he had invented his own and our death. He sought out many inventions. First, his fall was voluntary. He had a power not to fall. Free will was a sufficient shield to repel temptation. The devil could not have forced him unless he had given him his consent. Satan was only a suitor to woo, not a king to compel, but Adam gave away his own power and suffered himself to be decoyed into sin, like a young gallant who at one throw loses a fair lordship. Adam had a fair lordship. He was lord of the world, have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth, Genesis 1.28. But he lost all at one throw. Soon as he sinned, he forfeited paradise. Second, Adam's fall was sudden. He did not long continue in his royal majesty. How long did Adam continue, you ask, in paradise before he fell? Tostatus says he fell the next day. Pererius says he fell the eighth day after his creation. The most probable and received opinion is that he 
fell the very same day in which he was created. So Irenaeus, Cyril, Epiphanasius, and many others. The reasons which incline me to believe so are, firstly, it is said Satan was a murderer from the beginning, John 8:44. Now, whom did he murder? Not the blessed angels. He could not reach them, nor the cursed angels, for they had before destroyed themselves. How then was Satan a murderer from the beginning? As soon as Satan fell, he began to tempt mankind to sin. This was a murdering temptation, by which it appears Adam did not stay long in paradise. Soon after his creation, the devil set upon him and murdered him by his temptation. Secondly, Adam had not yet eaten of the tree of life, and now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden. Genesis 3:22 and 23. This tree of life being one of the choicest fruits in the garden and being placed in the midst of paradise, it is very likely Adam would have eaten of this tree of life. One of the first had not the serpent beguiled him with the tree of knowledge. So that I conclude Adam fell the very day of his creation because he had not tasted the tree of life, that tree that was most in his eye and had such delicious fruit growing upon it. Thirdly, man being in honor abideth not. Psalm 49.12 The rabbins read it thus, Adam being in honor lodged not one night. The Hebrew word for abide signifies to stay or lodge all night. Adam, then it seems, did not take up one night's lodging in paradise. Use 1. From Adam's sudden fall learn the weakness of human nature. Adam, in a state of integrity, quickly made a defection from God. He soon lost the robe of innocence and the glory of paradise. If our nature was thus weak when it was at its best, what is it now when it is at the worst? If Adam did not stand when he was perfectly righteous, how unable are we to stand when sin has cut the lock of our original righteousness? If purified nature did not stand, how shall corrupt nature... If Adam, in a few hours, sinned himself out of paradise, how quickly would we sin ourselves into hell if we were not kept by a greater power than our own? But God puts underneath his everlasting arms. Deuteronomy 33:27. Use 2. From Adam's sudden fall, learn how sad it is for man to be left to himself. Adam, being left to himself, fell. Oh, then what will become of us? How soon fall if God should leave us to ourselves? A man without God's grace left to himself is like a ship in a storm without pilot or anchor and is ready to dash upon every rock. Make this prayer to God, Lord, do not leave me to myself. If Adam fell so soon who had strength, how soon shall I fall who have no strength? Oh, urge God with his hand and seal. My strength shall be made perfect in weakness, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And thus far the reading of Thomas Watson's A Body of Divinity. This Reformation audio track is a production of Stillwater's Revival Books. You are welcome to make copies and give them to those in need. SWRB makes thousands of classic Reformation resources available, free and for sale, in audio, video, and printed formats. It is likely that the sermon or book that you just listened to is also available on cassette or video, or as a printed book or booklet. Our many free resources, as well as our complete mail-order catalog, containing thousands of classic and contemporary Puritan and Reform books, tapes, and videos at great discounts, is on the web at www.swrb.com. We can also be reached by email at swrb at swrb.com by phone at 780-450-3730 by fax at 780-468-1096 or by mail at 4710-37A Avenue Edmonton that's E-D-M-O-N-T-O-N Alberta abbreviated capital A capital B Canada T6L3T5. You may also request a free printed catalog. And remember that John Calvin, in defending the Reformation's regulative principle of worship, or what is sometimes called the scriptural law of worship, commenting on the words of God, which I commanded them not, neither came into my heart, from his commentary on Jeremiah 731, writes, 
God here cuts off from men every occasion for making evasions, since he condemns by this one phrase, I have not commanded them, whatever the Jews devised. There is then no other argument needed to condemn superstitions than that they are not commanded by God. For when men allow themselves to worship God according to their own fancies, and attend not to his commands, they pervert true religion. And if this principle was adopted by the Papists, all those fictitious modes of worship in which they absurdly exercise themselves would fall to the ground. It is indeed a horrible thing for the Papists to seek to discharge their duties towards God by performing their own superstitions. There is an immense number of them, as it is well known, and as it manifestly appears. Were they to admit this principle, that we cannot rightly worship God except by obeying his word, they would be delivered from their deep abyss of error. The prophet's words, then, are very important when he says that God had commanded no such thing and that it never came to his mind, as though he had said that men assume too much wisdom when they devise what he never required, nay, what he never knew.